Greetings and welcome back, fellow audio enthusiasts. It is I, Jason, your host of Two Channel Listening. This week's review is brought to you by my friends at The Music Room in Erie, Colorado. Duncan, go ahead and take it away. The Music Room is the world's leader in used hi-fi audio and a dealer for many of the best brands in the business. We've heard it all and we know what works. All right. Why did I request the Vienna Acoustics Mozart Grand SEs? Folks, my audio journey has always been regulated by, it seems like, three things. It is access, opportunity, and the most important, price. I've been following Vienna Acoustics for a while, and I will say that ever since I first got a glimpse of their Beethoven concert grands finished in that rosewood veneer, I thought, my God, that is a really handsome speaker. One day I would love to audition that type of speaker, price notwithstanding. So when serendipity smiled on me and the music room actually bought out another retailer's stock, they made my wish come true and I was actually able to request this demo, this open box demo pair of the Grand Mozart SEs. Mozart Grand SEs. So, <clears throat> let me tell you this. Let's get this out of the way up front. There is a popular YouTuber out there who also does audio reviews. Actually, wait, let me take that back. He does reviews of his measurements. That's right, okay. Yes, I think you know him. GR Research, Danny Ritchie. Yes, he actually did two videos where he had a customer's pair of the Mozart standards. I went back and looked multiple times. Danny made a review video of his measurements of the Vienna Acoustic Mozart standards. That bears repeating. He made a video talking about the measurements and how awful they are. He never at one point actually set up a pair of Vienna Acoustics in his room with his system and gave them a listen. You know, that's something that another website tends to like to do, is just bash speakers based on measurements without ever having listened to them. wonder who that could be. Anyway, um, I do listen to the speakers, and I've had these for two months, and let me tell you, Wow. Blah, 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 blah. No. These are the SCs. These are the latest version. A version is supposed to address a lot of those measurement uh, variables and idiosyncrasies. Maybe. Now, let's get started, shall we? Here is the specifications for all of you who like to see the specifications. Let's dig into what we have here. All right, here are your specs of the model in my room. I feel like I have to mention the price up front to discuss the fit and finish and the build quality. When there was a US distributor, these retailed new for $4,500 in their standard finish, just under the cost of my Harbus C7 XDs. The cabinets are actually sourced from an Italian furniture maker and let me say this, these are some dense mofos. They are very compact cabinets and rather small by floor standing speaker standards, and yet they weigh in at 58 pounds each. The bulk of that is coming from these front and rear baffles that are nearly a one point quarter inch thick. They are real wood throughout with some, uh, I'm gonna say sparse, but some specific internal bracing at key spots, uh, as, blah, key spots along with three layers of rock wool damping pads. This warm cherry veneer is above reproach. Vienna Acoustics has this unique rear crossover mount plate with two long reflex base tubes. The crossover is very narrow but runs the length of the bottom of the plate. This is not an easy piece to remove, folks. The mixed alloy connectors are big and easy to use, 
no ferrous materials whatsoever. I ran my 30 pound magnet across them and there was no pull or sticking or whatsoever. So nice job there, guys. Kind of what you would expect for a $4,500 speaker. Nevertheless, the outriggers, they are equally re robust textured steel with these long carpet spikes and they do give you some level of adjustment for tilting if desired. I did about two degrees. I have one major complaint and that is the f and that is the grill or I should say the way the grill is affixed. So the grill it has compression pins drilled into the front of this beautiful baffle. And let my let me tell you when you get to the Beethoven baby grants it's a crying shame. You've got this specialty Italian furniture manufacturer and they couldn't figure out how to bury some magnets into the back of the baffle of these speakers to go with this just beautiful fit and finish. And then there's something else. This is a very complex speaker grill. It has this fold in the center and right down the center of it is this deflecting rod. So you have this rod that sits right in between the tweeter. It does have these little vents, but as you can see, the frame takes up an, a lot of airspace that should be devoted to the drivers actually projecting out. So there's nothing I can't find. I couldn't research anything. I couldn't find anything specific to the way that the grills are designed. Whereas we know with Alan Shaw, he did design the harvest for the grills to be in place while they're sunk, countersunk into the speaker and you don't have that side diffraction. Well, these are some, you know, this is a lot of blockage if you're asking me. And since I couldn't get access or get any of my questions answered directly from Vienna Acoustics, thanks Peter, um, I spent the majority of my time with these off both speakers. I did listen to the Harbus with the grills on. I just love to show the Harbus with the grills off because I think they are a handsome, vintage-esque looking speaker. Nevertheless, let's talk about the drivers, shall we? <clears throat> the drivers have a lot in common with the Harbus. The tweeter is a custom-made hand-coded affair from ScanSpeak. Pretty typical of most manufacturers, I would say. However, like the Harbeth, the mid-range and the woofers are completely bespoke, mixed-medium polypropylene design, specifically calibrated by the founder, Peter Gangster. He was not happy with any of the available uh, off-the-shelf drivers, mind you, from the big suppliers. And when you think about it, Talk about Ciaz, ScanSpeak, Dyn Audio, SB Acoustics, even though they're kind of newer. That's one hell of an admonishment. P Peter formulated a variation of the poly materials and used uh, these unique stiffening ribs to give us the X3P spider cone woofer. The mid range is made of the same X3P materials, sans those stiffeners. So the Mozart Grand SC is in fact a two and a half way design. You've got your spider cone six inch woofer down below, followed by the six inch mid range driver. And then at the top is that, that scan speak 1.1 inch hand coated driver. The other unusual note about Peter's drivers are they're shielded. I could find nothing about this anywhere and again, he offers nothing to anybody to talk about why the heck he's using shielded drivers. Hopefully, by the time I get to my Beethoven review, I can circle back with all you and get a few of my questions answered. All right. Let's back up and talk about Danny's measurements for a minute again. There is some validity to the bizarre treble dip. I cannot tell you what it is because nowhere does Peter offer anyone, not even Stereophile magazines, some insight with why such a weird compromise was made. If you go back to the earlier models, um, 
the measurements are actually worse with Stereophile's 1997 review that they reposted in 2005. However, the SC is supposed to take everything up a notch, but I can tell you I still experience some strange audible anomalies. Now, what you all came here for, what you all want to know, the Mozart Grand SCs versus my Harbus C7 XDs. There is a short descriptive phrase I'm going to attribute to the overall sound of these Mozart Grand SEs. Their character is summed up as warm, delicate, and crispy. For many of you, warm and crispy may sound like opposite ends of the spectrum to describe a sound. But I can assure you, after two months living with these, I stand by warm, delicate, and crispy. Let's start with warm. Inherently, these are easy to listen to all day long with nearly zero fatigue factor. As a matter of fact, I found the uncanny resemblance in the sound of the Mozart Grand SEs reminiscent of the Harbeth P3 ESR, ESR XDs just add the ability of the Mozarts to, to render useful in-room bass response down to 35 hertz and you have, right off the bat, a better P3 ESR XD. Voices are well-defined with such kinsmanship to the Harbeth vocal renderings. I have to attribute that sonic coincidence to those polypropylene mid-range cones. The Mozart are both smooth and yet nuanced. They offer the most unclinical separation of instruments I have heard, and that keeps them interesting instead of boring and disconnected. One key takeaway, when matched up against my C7 XDs, the Mozart can provide much lower bass response that does fill in for orchestral music for a more satisfying sonic picture. Now, the delicate. The Mozart, they split the difference between my Harbeth P3s, or not my, the demo P3s, and the C7s with this inner detail retrieval. I listen to a great deal of orchestral music and I am hard to press to say if I've ever heard a better defined harp plucks, bell ring decays, and at times I swear I heard the sound of the piano keys rebounding to their pads. The finer details are not lost on the Mozart SE and I feel they, they are portraying an even more clearly to find space than my C7s, and thus, they can do what the little P3 ESRs are capable of. Now the crispy. What do I mean? Saying the Mozart are warm should not be confused with forgiving, veiled, or lacking extension. Quite the contrary. When pushed with budget gear like my NAD D3045 D3045 integrated amplifier, they can get strained and grainy. Bump that up to my NAD388 with the Blue OS. It does a fine job at being an enjoyable combination, but it too lacks the refinement that the Mozart seek. The Mozart are less forgiving than the Harbeth with budget front end gear, and much more consideration needs to go into quality source matching. I call them crispy because when you do have the higher quality gear connected to the Mozart, they really project air around the notes, like you've switched on a macro lens. There are tracks I played where the sound envelo enveloped me in a manner I had only remembered hearing with my totem acoustic fires connected to Mark Levinson gear. I heard notes unfolding perpendicular to my ears that was pleasantly startling. I throw the Harbor C7s back in, and they could not replicate that feeling. They do still expand well and sound bigger, but not as if I had mini monitors pointed at my sides like the Mozarts. That crispy also defines the extended decay times and the metallic instruments. Crash cymbals had so much texture. I'm not an instrument buff who can name off brands based on hearing, but I bet those who can would have a field day listening to these Mozart Grand SEs. Drum heads were so taut, the various pitch of toms were so defined, 
I am sure that those with the training could call out the types of wood used in the various drum kits. When I was listening to Tidal MQA tracks, yes, I finally dived in and got a subscription, I could hear the saliva smacking across Sia's lips between those vocal notes. That's how I attribute crisp definition, thus the crispy. Okay, so far, it sounds like a hell of a lot of high praise for the Vienna Acoustics Mozart Grand SEs. Yes, sounds like I'm pretty much dead set on trading in my Harbus for this demo set here in Cherry. Not so fast, folks. Let me tell you, there is a crucial, critical thing missing with the Mozarts. Now, I listen to a lot of orchestral music, and that is their specialty. These speakers, they're uncanny how well they do orchestral music. However, however, there's another level to describing these speakers for you. It's like beautiful black and white photography. You admire it. There's a there's just different details that your eye picks out. There's different textures. There's a different dimension there. And while black and white photography can be its own form of art, over time, just looking at nothing but black and white photography, you're missing a serious, you're missing the most serious ingredients, the punch of color. The Mozart, they lack punch. There's just, the bass doesn't have the punch. Let me say that a different way. Away from orchestral music now. Let's go with Black Sabbath, Mob Rules, Falling Off the Edge of the World. I already know a few of you are going to be shaking your heads. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. A minute 20 into the track, you've got... You've got Mr. Ward setting up that time signature change with those drums. Bum, 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 bum. Folks, let me tell you, with my old Zoo Omen Def speakers, you could feel the hell out of that time signature change. Here, it's as if when I'm playing that track, I'm leaning forward waiting for it, and it doesn't come. I hear the notes, I hear the tone of the drums and the texture's beautiful, but I don't get the tinglys. I'm not getting, I'm not getting that physical transference. Or said another way, there's an omission of the air molecules getting excited. And for me as a music lover, that is a critical component missing from these speakers. They do everything else so beautifully, but without the punch, these small drivers, these six inch drivers, they're just, they're regulated by the physics of how much output they can produce. While this interesting bass reflex design with the two rear ports does a great job with 35 Hertz in room, and again, the tone, but if you can't feel it, and it does have that rhythm, it does have that prat the Brits like to talk about, but going on to Tool, you start playing some Tool inoculum, and again, it's the same thing. I'm expecting for the pulse, I'm expecting for my pulse to start raising, to get excited about that drum solo. And it's just, I'm hearing it, yeah, sounds good, but I'm not that excited. And that's, that's you know, that's a critical piece to your favorite music. You have to feel it, you have to feel excited about it. And that leads to this last critical thing I have to say about the Mozarts versus my, my C7s. The way it, it produces the vocals and where they sit within the audio spectrum. Now, I talked about how there's a lot of similarities in the voicing, those, pro, those polypropylene cones. There's definitely kinship between the Harbeth line and the Vienna Acoustics. But when listening to these Mozart SEs, at most times, the vocals are set further back and almost like they're arranged sometimes behind the other musicians. Now, especially when you're listening to the live, the live tracks, that just feels completely out of place. It, it's not right. It doesn't sit right with me. 
and it was no matter what I did with all the persnickety changing, tilting them back, moving them in, moving them out, moving them closer, the vocals, they were solid, they were stuck, they are locked in like, like laser beams, but like five feet further back than what you would expect. So, move the Vienna out, throw my C7s right in the same exact spot without even all the dialing in with the Harbus, Throw on, throw on Allison Krauss, a new favorite. All of a sudden, I mean, there she is, right in front of you with her angelic voice serenading you. And it's like, I've paid my coin to Charon and I'm gliding across the river Styx. That is the key difference, folks, between the C7s and these Mozarts. So no, I will not be trading in my C7s for their Mozart SEs. As, as beautiful as they look, as beautiful as they sound, they didn't have the physical connection that I was looking for that the larger driver of the Harbus could produce. However, can the Beethoven Baby Grands with that extra X3P driver and larger cabinet, can that fill in the gap of the Mozart SEs? Well, you're going to have to tune in for round two of the Vienna Acoustics versus my Harvest C7 XDs. I hope you like this. Please subscribe. Please hit the thumbs up for me, folks. I appreciate the support. Until next time, continue listening to your music. Enjoy that music for what it is. It's a transportation device. And I wish you all a wonderful and pleasant week. I'll see you next time. Thank you.